So, in other words, this is where the no free lunch comes in. You know TANSTOFFEL, the acronym TANSTOFFEL? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch, right? There ain't no such thing as a free lunch because whenever we pick something, we give something else up. Somebody has to pay for it. It might not be you, maybe it's somebody else. That's a beautiful thing when you can spend someone else's money, but uh, it's most not, not often the case. You usually have to spend your own money. So there's no free lunches. I like to look for people trying to achieve free lunches. People forget about scarcity and they forget about opportunity cost and they forget that they have to make choices and they look for free lunches. So when I, when I see in the paper that some state has passed a referendum that uh, cuts their auto insurance rates in half because greedy insurers are exploiting customers, the, my, my free lunch red flag goes up because there's a reason premiums are as high as they are, to cover the cost of production, to provide a reasonable profit to the uh, suppliers of that insurance service. And when you arbitrarily cut that in half, uh, all kind of perverse consequences happen. So it's a, it's a search for a free lunch. So opportunity cost is probably, opportunity cost is the way economists measure cost. What are you giving up? What's everything that's being given up? And. Uh, Opportunity cost is, is probably the most fundamental notion of economics. Scarcity, choice, opportunity cost, trade-offs, giving things up when we pick something, very fundamental notions. So, okay. Are you all familiar with these notions? How, how many of you teach economics? Okay, okay. Go ahead. Um, how do you distinguish between a change that, uh, what's what you call the secondary result? Yes. And something that's just historically going to happen whether you like it or not. For example, um, the loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States, which with our high health benefits, our high pay and everything else, and we're losing manufacturing jobs right in left other countries. And maybe that's just, how do you, was that just part of, of the way the economy is going to go? And we're going to go into another kind of economy? Or is that bad? I mean, from the point of view of the people in the factories, that's really bad. I'm not, sh I'm not sure. That's a good question. And it's a, well, take your example of loss of manufacturing employment. Manu manufacturing, well, it's a very complicated question because you have, there are often cyclical things happening in the economy, things that go in cycles, short term things. There are often structural things happening in the, in the economy that, that are long-term structural trends, long-term trends. Cyclical things or structural things may be unintended consequences of policy. So for example, why does the United States lose manufacturing jobs? Uh, because we're uncompetitive in some areas, not in all areas, in some in, in in uh, personal computers and in uh, advanced materials and semiconductors and even chemicals, the United States has a, has a competitive advantage against other countries, even in automobiles, once again, in automobiles. But in other areas, we don't, like leather and shoes and clothing and labor-intensive things like that, we don't. Now, there would be a structural trend for uh, those jobs to move offshore from the functioning of a competitive market. India and Pakistan should specialize in leather goods, and the United States should specialize in integrated circuits and computers. We should exchange with one another, and we'll both be made better off because of that. Now, that the loss of manufacturing jobs may be an unintended consequence of other policies. Now, now part, a portion of the loss of manufacturing jobs may be an unintended consequence of other of other policies. For example, if we uh, punitively tax employers with payroll taxes, so for example, uh, an employer has to pay 7.6% or 7.8% of your salary, your gross salary, as Social Security benefits. Now as far as your employer is concerned, they don't care if they pay you 7.8% or if they pay Uncle Sam 7.8%, it's still employee compensation. That raises the cost of labor artificially that raises the cost of production. It's just as if there were a wage increase, only those wages are paid automatically to government. 
And that makes U.S. manufacturers uncompetitive. Or for example, suppose we, we impose punitive environmental regulations on our manufacturers. And they don't have similar environmental regulations in Pakistan or India. That will lead to a loss of manufacturing jobs in the United States and a transfer of those to other countries because of differentials in cost of production. Now, I'm not saying that environmental regulations are a bad thing, but I am saying that loss of manufacturing employment may be an unintended consequence of taxation or regulatory powers of government. So the question you asked me is a very complicated question, <laughs> and I'm not sure I answered it, but you know, p part of that, I think, would be a natural consequence of the functioning of a market economy. That's what should happen. But a, but a mass exodus of employment out of a country like Germany, for example, where the average wage in Germany is now $43 an hour, including benefits. I mean, that's largely because of, of uh, very burdensome governmental employment taxation. The consequence is they're going to lose manufacturing jobs. I mean, German companies are opening manufacturing facilities in the United States at a really rapid clip down in North Carolina and South Carolina is their preferred location. Although we have a lot, we've been a, uh, Michigan has been a major beneficiary of that foreign direct investment because they have to get out of Germany as soon as they can because they won't be able to complete, compete on a worldwide basis because of that punitive tax burden. And that is an unintended consequence of their social welfare programs. An unintended consequence of social welfare programs, the taxation that goes along with them, and the uncompetitiveness that that places on manufacturing within uh, the, the Federal Republic of Germany. Did I answer your question? Yes, I think you, you, you showed it. It's very, very hard to tell. Whether you should change public policy or see if it's a structural change. Yeah. You'd have to, you, each issue is so complicated, you'd have to have a lot of material to make one decision. Well, you see, in economics, everything is connected to everything else. You know, and nothing is simple. You know, I'm, I'm often amazed in the media when I see things like, well, people are poor. Well, let's therefore raise minimum wages. Or, you know, we're not competitive against foreign countries. Well, let's just put protectionist barriers against their products. Or uh, interest rates are too high. Well, let's increase the rate of growth of the money stock. And they're very simplistic solutions to complicated problems. And those simplistic solutions often have perverse, secondary, unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank you. That was a good question. Hard question. Um, so let's see. What number are we on? No, we must be on four. We'd be on that. Four? Oh, all that for them. We've only got through three. Four is subjective value. Subjective value means that the value of any commodity is not objective. It's subjective. Nothing has any intrinsic or implicit value. Value is not the value of the labor that went into its production. Value is not its total cost of production. Value is the price at which something is, can be traded in the marketplace. And that price is a function both of the cost of production, but primarily of the uh, satisfaction that a consumer would derive from that product. So the value of something is what someone is willing to pay for it. Uh, this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about value. Up until the 19th century, people thought value was cost of production. End of the 19th century, people invented a theory of subjective value. We'll see why this is important momentarily, but subjective value just basically means no objective value. Value depends primarily on preferences, what people like. So if people really, if Japanese investors really like Van Gogh paintings, they'll pay $35 million for them. If uh, two years later they go to sell that Van Gogh painting and it only commands a price of $17 million, well, that's its value. Its value isn't $35 million anymore just because it sold for $35 million at one point in time. Its value is now only $17 million because that's the amount that someone's willing to pay for it. So subjective value. So, some, some wag once said that economists know the price of everything and the value of nothing. They were wrong because economists don't distinguish between value and price. Value and price are the same thing. Excuse me, does that mean JFK's golf club won't sell for half a million? Oh, they could well. 
No, that that's just saying the value.